Do you want a clicker? I mean, if you're recording it, like. <laughs> you want to. Again, not a professor, just a just a dude giving a presentation today. See if I can turn down. I don't know if it's over or not. You gotta ask them. See better for us? Okay. <laughs> One o'clock. One o'clock. We can get started. Okay. Cool. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Cardona. I teach, you know, tree hugging sciences here at CCBC Essex. <laughs> Environmental science, oceanography, that kind of stuff. But this is my friend Jerry Crenshaw, who works for NASA, uh, working on satellites. And uh, I'll let you take it away here. <laughs> okay. So yeah. Um, name's Jerry Crenshaw. I work for the Aerospace Corporation, and I'm currently working under one of the United States Geological Survey projects, uh, the Landsat project. Um, I'm the Landsat mission manager. I oversee the operations for three low Earth orbit, orbit satellites that are been involved in the Landsat program for, or that are continuing the Landsat program, which has been started in the 70s and is the longest running um, satellite imaging program on the, uh, on the world, taking pictures of the continental United States and any changing land masses, daylight land masses that they can capture on the West. I've uh, been doing satellite operations for about a decade now, and I've always been in low Earth orbit, but I'm some sure you've all, if you've been paying attention to any sort of science news, know that we've got the low Earth orbit satellites all the way down there. We've got a ton of GPS satellites and geostationary satellites flying all the way out here. And we've even got deep space satellites that are uh, taking pictures of many different planets, different solar systems, different galaxies, and um, and beyond. So I'm really excited to be working in the, uh, the space field, and it's one of my passions, and I'm glad I got a chance to share it with you guys today. So I plan on talking through how satellite operations relate to the sciences that you all are learning. Uh, Dr. Cardona, let me know that physics classes were going, so I tried to tailor this presentation to some high-level physics concepts that you all might or might not be touching on. Feel free to ask as many questions as you want and stop me. And I've also got plenty of time at the end to uh, field as many other questions as you guys might have. Again, I'm trying to start at the surface, but if you guys want to drill deeper, I'm happy to accommodate, but if I don't know, I'll at least give you a link or something to Google that'll help you with your uh, learning. And I'm going to pass this around for attendance. So you can use your code to write the info that's on there. Hey. Hello. With the low Earth orbit satellites that I've been running, um, they're primarily used for taking pictures and weather forecasting. And the main scientific principle behind that one is optics. And absorbing light and learning how to sense that light, record that light, and then transmit it back at light speed through radio waves <clears throat> back to us so that we can then decode it and play it back on the ground so that everybody has weather forecasting, pretty pictures, storm damage, and good pictures of satellite or good pictures of hurricanes while not being in a hurricane. Um, and really, light is the basis of everything that I do. Uh, once we get to the scientific side of things, but for the operation side of things, there's a lot of other mechanics and electro electromagnetics that we focus on in that thing for keeping the satellite in the uh, in its proper orientation. But we each satellite that we've got that I'm running now, and each satellite that I've done that I've worked on previously has got a suite of sensors that detect anywhere from the radio waves all the way up to just on the brink of visible and ultraviolet for the um, weather forecasting and just land, land imaging satellites, land imaging pictures that we take. And to do those or to capture all those different things, we need to find a material that is sensitive to all of those different um, wavelengths at the, at the various wavelengths so that we can see things that, so we can sense those things and see the things outside of the visible sphere that will provide information. 
There's a lot of information to be gleaned from microwave and infrared um, wavelengths for science, uh, for a lot of sounding data for forecasting, and then of course visible for the types of satellites that I'm doing now that are tracking land mass formations and changes. Um, you actually know more about this than I do, so if you want to chime in anytime. Well, <laughs> at least from the county changes. The geomorphologist over here, but <laughs> yeah, we can use a lot of this data to map out not only changes on land but the ocean and temperature changes, and climate change, and, and a lot of satellites in space are actually communicating with Argo floats in the ocean, which I got to deploy one last week with um, in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, but yeah, there, yep. we get a lot of data about. Meteorology data, oceanography data, uh, geomorphology data, all kinds yep. of very useful information to see what's happening to Earth as it changes from these satellites. Yeah. So, yeah, optics is cool. So, all of those multi channel, all the word that was the word I was reaching for on the last slide, these multi channel optical sensors that are sensing the different wavelengths. We put those all in these different satellites to take these beautiful, wonderful pictures. Uh, what you have here is a full disk image of the our, our side of our hemisphere. Of Earth. You can see North and South America. This was actually taken by the GOES S satellite in 2016, right as we here in Maryland were about to get smashed by this winter storm. Um, but oh, nice. Looking for the attendance thing, I thought it was a question. But, um, but yeah, you can see clearly these are all taken in the visible light imagery. And then um, in the smaller image in the uh, corner over there, that's taken from one of my old satellites. Actually, I'm wearing the shirt for this one, JPSS2. It's taken from the visible, the VIRS, in, the, the VIRS instrument, was it visible infrared imaging spectrometer, radioscopy or something like that. And taken off the coast of the Iberian Peninsula, and you can see some of the trails from the uh, the shipping lanes in the clouds there. So a lot of information to be gleaned from these. Um, I do get into some other different science applications in later slides, but this is, at least for Earth absorbing satellites, this is our bread and butter. And you'll see a lot of these full disk things. A lot of this data goes to immediately to um, Weather Channel, AccuWeather, all that sort of stuff, so they can see what's happening now. But all the smaller sort of data there and the different imaging suites or the different instruments that come with that one, those go to the uh, the weather forecasting stuff, so they can use the sounding data that they take various for temperature and moisture measurements at different altitudes to feed into their uh, forecasting models. So any questions here? No? Simple? Simple. All right, so like I said before, you source all these different materials that absorb and react and emit different wavelengths of light, and then we build them into sensors that go onto the satellites that are going in orbit. This is a incredibly simplified circuit of one of the photovoltaic cells that we've used for, uh, for sensitive design. Of course, there are different levels of impedance and tuning that needs to be involved for the different materials that are reacting in the different ways. But for all those different chemical makeups you see below, they're burning out that way. Those are the kind of uh, materials that we use and try to capture into the different cells and sensors so that we can sense the different wavelengths. So this is where the physics breaks down into chemistry, electro or chemistry and circuits. That's the word I was looking for. There you go. Okay. Um, anything here? All right. So engineering and mathematics on this side of things, again, very, very simplified, but we've got all these satellites in orbit going around the Earth and we've got to talk with them. And what we use to talk with them are the satellites that are the antennas that you would see on the ground. And um, I don't know if CCBC has some, but I think UMBC has some, yeah, some antennas they use on the ground. 
and the little ray domes that they track the different things. And actually, if you go, there are some open source uh, direct broadcast data that you all, if you felt like getting a Raspberry Pi and doing a little bit of homework and some programming of your own, you could bring down uh, your own weather data from the NOAA satellites in real time to get your own pictures. But essentially, it's just we've got these satellites that are orbiting orbiting in low Earth somewhere between 700 and 900 kilometers in the altitude. And they're traveling at 16,000 miles an hour, about five miles a second, over the, over the course of the sky. And we've got to aim the antenna at them to track them. And that's just a lot of active geometry being played out that is done through the use of two line elements and a lot of pre computer programming and signal tracking to track these things. So this is where another, this is another intersection, another breakdown of physics into now still optics because we're tracking a radio signal coming from the earth up to the satellite and back down, but also the uh, the mechanics of it because we've got to position these satellites, we've got to ensure that they can move in the degrees of freedom that's necessary to track them or track the satellites as they move over the sky at different elevations here, there, and everywhere. So you guys said you were in mechanics? Yeah, this is this is exactly what y'all will be doing. Like, all the math that goes into this and calculating the ranges of motion, especially in that example, that would be that's the math that, that's the applied math that you all will be doing here. And you'd be surprised. It's not so much the math that's the issue, but the controls algorithms so that you make sure you have the precision that's that's involved there. So as you learn the physics, get really good at that. You're really good at the mechanics, but but then when you if you really want to pursue something like this, control theory is where it's going to be for you guys. Uh, any other questions? Curiosities? No? All right, cool. This is the easy group. All right, engineering and science. So this is where I was really trying to lean into the uh, the intro to physics thing, uh, especially when I was talking with the the satellite itself. So this is where we have to separate the instruments, which are sensing the light that the Earth the Earth is putting off and taking the pictures that give us beautiful weather forecasting and all the pretty pictures that, that I showed you. But then actual, this is actually more towards the things that are actually controlling the satellite mechanics itself, because as anyone who's thrown any kind of ball will tell you, as soon as that ball leaves your hand, unless you impart the right kind of motion on it, it's going to float here, there, and everywhere. It'll be reoriented, and it'll be affected by wind drag, um, gravity, and anything else that might be might be doing. But if we're taking pictures, and we know that we have the apertures of our cameras facing a certain way, we need to have our satellite oriented so that the apertures of our cameras are facing exactly that way. So this is really also where the controls and the sensors comes in, and it becomes an incredibly complex concert of problems to not only orient the satellite itself properly, but then allow for the satellite to move properly with the Earth changing of the Earth's surface as well as all the subsystems within it to within the satellite that are taking that are managing power output, temperature and heat dissipation, um, even the computers running the imaging and all that sort of stuff, and the powering on and off of the antennas, and making sure that they're all playing nicely so that there aren't any unexpected interplay between those subsystems that would then throw off the images or throw off the, the orientation of the satellite we're trying to get to. Um, so what I was going to try to do here, if y'all are feeling brave enough, is I put a simple free body diagram over here on the side of the um, of the black of the chalkboard, and I gave you the direction that the satellite is going in green, but all every all the red arrows are the forces, super simplified again, that the satellite is subject to. Anybody want to? And we've got four that we can identify. Anybody want to take any guesses as to which the four which the four are based off of what I've got on here and what you know about things moving in through orbit? 
What you got, bud? Enjoy the arrow going down the force of gravity. Yes, that's the easy one. <laughs> but yeah, we got the force of gravity going straight down. The one going that way would be any kind of like resistance from like the atmosphere. Do you know exactly? You're you're exactly right. Well, I don't know how high up we are. If there's still like you know, oh, air right. to really interact with, or if we I should have talked through vacuum space. I should have talked through that. So the center of the the center that's in a picture there. We have the atmosphere of the Earth diagram. I don't know if y'all can read it, but these two lines. This one's 700 kilometers. That one's 10,000 kilometers. Or what's 10,000 kilometers? 6,000 miles. So if you're in low Earth orbit you're still within the exosphere, so there's still some atmospheric drag. So that's exactly what they're referring to. And yeah, that's exactly the course. Um, so low Earth orbit does, which is what I was doing here, they do, they are affected by atmospheric drag, but if you're in a geosynchronous orbit, which is out at 22,000 miles? Don't quote me on that. It's like 22,000 or 22,400 miles in altitude, they don't have to deal with atmospheric drag, right? but they've got solar winds, which are their own beast. But yeah, we'll go with the force of drag of that one. So we got one going that way, and then one going into the the uh, the chalkboard, whiteboard, whatever. Who's got some guesses? Light force, well, straight. What is that? Direction, so light force. Flat force, yeah, that's right. The propulsive force, because all the satellites that we launch, they aren't going to be in purely ballistic motion because we want to maintain the orbit that they have for as long as, they, for as long as we intend to use them. And if there's solar drag, we've got to, the solar drag's going to be trying to lessen their altitude, so we've got to apply some force to, to keep them up there. Good thinking. So, we'll go with force propulsion. And then, yeah, first is on everyone. That's honestly, once the satellites are up on orbit, that part is the thing that makes up the about eighty percent of my job. And then you also you also have to factor in the amounts of um, fuel lost um, subtracts from the overall mass of the system. You have to change your course. That's correct. And that's the 80% of the job I was talking about. Like every time we do a different uh, propulsive maneuver, that's a certain amount of fuel loss, which changes the inertial properties of the satellite, changes the total mass of the satellite, the displacement of the mass of the satellite, all that sort of stuff. And makes a lot of the calculations that we have to do to for every other maneuver calculate for every other maneuver we want to do just a little bit more not hard but different. So they're not bog standard every single time. What's up? So if you know the satellite's like constantly revolving around the Earth and that like kind of changes its position, what do you do to stabilize it so your apertures are always facing down at like Earth? Excellent question. I was really looking for a diagram for that one, but what we use are essentially gyroscopes. Um, they're called reaction wheels, okay. and they're on several different axes like four different axes that we can use to control the three-dimensional motion of the satellite. Um, what they do is they essentially store energy in the form of gyroscopic energy, and anytime we spin them up or slow them down, that change in their length, angular momentum, results in a change in our physical position or orientation. So as we're going around the Earth, and like you said, to keep the effort one we have them spinning. We have them spin at spend at the exact right speed so that the satellite as it goes around will stay pointed towards the Earth each time. But in the event that we need to reorient the satellite to perform, say, a drag makeup or to dodge a micrometeorite, we'll tilt it up so it'll go upwards and then keep doing their thing, or we'll even turn it around so it'll go backwards, and we'll redirect the um, the forces to adjust things that way. But that's those are one of the sensors that we definitely lean on for our attitude control and orientation control. Great question. And do you ever like so I assume like is the camera running the whole time and you're trying to get like a scan of the entire path of the satellite or 
depending on the mission, yes. Okay. The the weather forecasting satellites, yes, their cameras are on all the time because they want to. They're going to get full Earth coverage of like, hey, we want to see ocean temps, ozone, ozone thickness, uh, temp, air, and air temperature and air moisture level all throughout the entire Earth. And then all that data comes down and you can feed that into the different um, forecasting algorithms used by HEATSA and NASA and Acura and all that sort of stuff. But for the satellites that I'm using now, since they're only trying to take pictures of sunlit land masses, the only time our cameras are on then is when they're in sunlight. And then there's land below them and hopefully no cloud cover. So that they can actually get the, get the land. So for those, the sensors are only really actively being used roughly forty percent of the their their time on orbit. But yeah, there are a lot of different missions and a lot of different primary objectives that go the, go into the design of these different satellites, especially for these these sort of usage, but that doesn't even begin to jump into like comm satellites, deep space stuff, and all of those different applications of satellites as well. So any other guesses for this last forest? Honestly, I'll be real impressed if y'all get it. Pressure. Hmm? Pressure. 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 Because you know how you have some space, you might have some pressure going to the cabin. I like where you're going, but not quite. Think about this edge right here. Is that, is that magnetic? It's, it's magnetic. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Again, I didn't know how far y'all were getting into your physics, but Earth's got its magnetic field. Everybody knows that. Earth's magnetic field is wild, and not a lot of people know a lot about it, and we're still studying it. And actually, a lot of the science missions that are in low Earth orbit are studying the changes and trying to map out Earth's magnetic field at its various heights. But the issue with that is, as we will get to in later physics class, is changing magnetic fields and current going through the changing magnetic fields interact and cause forces that will physically move one another. And so, on our spacecraft buses, like we've got electronic power, we've got current going to different going to different sensors, actuators, cameras, and everything. And those are as isolated as they try to be, or can be made, so that they're not affected by that. But there's still some perturbations that happen in the attitude of the entire satellite from that. And there are even sensors on the spacecraft these days that sense Earth magnetic field and send it to the control units so that they can adjust the reaction wheels that I told you about earlier to keep them to absorb those perturbations too. So there you go. So by and large, you got yourself a satellite in space, drag propulsive, gravity, and then uh, the magnetic force. So yay. <laughs> And then snacks. <laughs> so let's see. What was I getting to with these? So the net, the rest of these slides um, are really just example slides of like the kind of data that um, the JPSS, so the NOAA satellites, so the weather satellites uh, that I worked on, like their design and the kind of data they bring down and how it's used. So this one. Just the box standard picture of the satellite. We got the big solar array that's used to power the satellite, store sunlight, turn it into electricity, store it in batteries. All right. Um, we've got the Veers, Chris, a ATMS, OMS, and Series instruments. Those are the different sensors and cameras that I told you about that are absorbing the light in the various wavelengths to be used for different things. And then um, those SMD to TDRS and SMD to ground antennas. Those are the waves. Those are essentially our radios, radio waves, the radio frequency antennas for how we get the controls up to the satellite and how we get the data down from the satellite. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into super detail on that one, but um, that's 
at least from a weather standpoint. By and large, the, the things that really control things like there's plenty of other sensors that I can go to in great detail here, but we don't need to go on that. Um, and this is the second or third time I've done this one for you. Third. Third. So since she, in her own words, the tree hugging scientist, I put in the tree hugging stuff. <laughs> this is. These are the instruments that we use for weather forecasting on the satellites that I've worked with previously. So primarily it's the advanced technology microwave sounder. It's absorbing light in the microwave segment of the electromagnetic spectrum to get air temperature, water temperature, and air moisture readings that feed into a forecast. Um, the microwave sounders provide the greatest impact on our forecasting accuracy. So the more we get up there, the better and probably longer duration uh, weather forecast we get. I know that Noah is working on taking another one of these exact type of sounders and just sticking it on to another bus to just launch it up just because they have it. They had it made from a previous project, so put it in space, make sure it works. And um, yeah, it provides a lot of data on the hydrologic cycle, rainfall rates, snow and ice formation, and it works in conjunction with Oh wait, data. Sorry, I thought the next one was um, the next instrument. But here's the data. And here on this image, you can see the 10 18 antenna temperature. So this is the temperature, I guess, at the surface of all these different slots that you can see in the keys down, keys down there. And then on the other side, we have the continental United States and the temperatures that you can that were being sensed at that, sensed at that time. What was that? January 16th, 2018. And the temps are in Kelvin, so 255 is pretty cold. Okay. There's a data example from there. Then the next instrument, which works in tandem with the one that you just saw, is our cross track infrared sounder. Excuse me. Again, another sounding infrared instrument, but now it's collecting the infrared in the infrared um, realm of the electromagnetic spectrum. So since it's in the infrared, it actually gets interference from clouds. So <clears throat> ATMS can see through clouds since it's checking, it's looking at uh, the microwave waves. Yeah, the, yeah, the microwave light. Chris cannot, but, it allows, but since it cannot see through clouds, it then gives us the ability to construct temperature profiles at various different altitudes for temperature, pressure, and moisture. And this also feeds into the weather forecasting. Um, other things that it helps with, provides data on the greenhouse gases and climate change and El Nino and La Nina effects, because yay for El Nino, it's about to mess up a whole lot. Of so there you go. Cross track infrared sounder data. This is a three day composite image of sea surface temps and the cloud top, cloud top temperatures. Um, and the way that you can kind of tell which ones are which is the cloud top temperatures are going to be much colder than anything else you're seeing. So that's how they infer where what they're looking at through the data they can see. So all of this right here, cloud top. All of that right there, sea surface. All of that right there, probably just Russia being cold. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> then we also have the uh, ozone mapping profile this week. This one collects the total column and for vertical profile of the ozone data. It's really useful, especially these days since we're trying to monitor our greenhouse gas usage and see how the ozone hole is actually being fixed right now. So thanks to international policy, one of our climate crises is going away. The others sorting out, but one of them, we're getting better. <laughs> Montreal Protocol. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so but it's also used to provide data for a uh, UV index forecast because if we have thinner parts of the ozone throughout the course of the Earth, it's a better part for people to be exposed to UV and get sunburned. So feeds into that, and then it also measures volcanic ash heights and sulfur dioxide uh, concentration in the atmosphere. And I know I know they're from volcanoes, but that, doesn't the increase the reflectance 
Yes, so sulfur dioxide is an aerosol that reflects sunlight. So we actually like sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere in terms of cooling the planet, but we don't like it because it mixes with water and gives us acid rain. Sulfuric acid. Yeah. Yeah. See, so, yeah. <laughs> I'm good and bad there. And then here's some of the info from that one. I do not know how to read this data. All I know is that's the ozone hole. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah, you, you want it to be in the red. You don't want it to be in the blue. And the biggest thinning is happening over Antarctica. So that's why it's in the danger zone, if you will. But it's not you, an actual hole. It's just thinning. Yeah, it's thin. Yeah. It's missing nowhere. But if you do, out of curiosity, look up the trending of the ozone thinning over the um, Antarctic for the past one. 40 years, you can see that yeah. it takes a good sharp turn and start starts relieving around 20, 2004, I want to say. Yeah, it was just worse in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, do you think, you know, why, why do you think it is that it's the thinnest where there's the least amount of people? What's like the correlation with that? So there are actually several factors that has to do with jet streams and moving on air, but also temperature. So it reacts more in colder temperatures. So we see it worse in their winter, which is our summer. But also, just because we just well, there doesn't mean it's getting any more UV radiation because it's like right at the top of the earth, which doesn't get any much UV radiation. I mean, it depends on the season, man. So, uh, yeah, the, not uh, as much as the, yeah. not as much wreck. I mean, it might get, it might make a path to atmosphere, but like, as term, in terms of it hitting the atmosphere, um, it's at a, it's, oh, you're saying it's at a more shallow, it's at a shallower angle? Yeah. So, it's, oh, okay. Now I see what you're trying to say. So yeah, no, it'll be at a shallower, shallower angle. Of course, like at the peak of what our winter, that's when Antarctica is going to be getting blasted with all the most direct sunlight it will be. But because of the what's that word? Inclination of Earth's uh, axis, so it is going to be a, a lot more indirect than it would be if it were if that thinning were at the equator or something like that. But yeah, good point. So we saw in the 80s, we found a correlation between high chlorine levels and low ozone. So we were able to trace that it was chlorofluorocarbons causing this problem, specifically the chlorine part. As a result of the Montreal Protocol, they started banning or producing a quantity of COCs in the atmosphere, replacing the chlorine with hydrogen. So we have high hydrofluorocarbons now. But there's certain things we just cannot get rid of, like asthma inhalers have COCs. You Cannot get rid of that, but it's such a minimal quantity that it doesn't affect it. The big thing that was causing this thinning was refrigeration and air conditioning that use CFCs. And now that has alternative chemicals that are used, which are also greenhouse gases. So we're replacing one problem with another. But of course, this is all in the stratosphere, not in the troposphere. So we're it's not quite directly related to climate change, uh, which happens in the troposphere. Much easier. <laughs> then the last one that we have on the uh, again, the small project. I don't have any of the instruments for my current project just yet, but visible infrared imaging radiometer suite. This is the one on my old satellites that took it takes the prettiest pictures. Like that's that's what it is. It's visible light and infrared light, so that and it when it's looking at a sunlit scene, it's going to give you a nice high def, beautiful picture of whatever's beneath it. But since it also works in the infrared, if it's looking at a scene that's on in nighttime of the Earth in the, in the Earth's shadow, you'll still be able to see what's going on. And it'll pick up city lights and even um, higher temperature spots with a lot more ease. So this is probably my favorite instrument, just because, or the favorite instrument that I had been in control of, because Again, pretty pictures. And here are, the, here are the examples of the pretty pictures. So this one is a composite, I don't know over how many days, but a composite of the Eastern Hemisphere. This is all Europe backlit in the in Earth's shadow. And um, over there, 
That is Hurricane Maria actively laying waste Puerto Rico. I was trying to ask you to pick that on purpose because I think the first time I did it, like I asked you, I was like, hey, so we just got this picture. I know it's tough for you being Puerto Rican and all, but it's a really good picture. <laughs> but um, but yeah, that's uh because then you can also see Florida at the international dateline there. So again, great pictures, really useful. And Great for science and marketing and anything. And I think, oh wait, serious. So this one, so this one I actually forgot about because the shirt that I'm wearing, they didn't put this on that one, but the, on the one before that had it on. But it's used for collecting data on the cloud height and cloud thickness, but also the energy being reflected by the Earth or emitted by the Earth. Um, and it's used, definitely used in climate science calculations because the sunlight puts off a whole bunch of heat. We absorb a lot of that, but we also radiate plenty of that. And that balance of heat intake or energy intake and energy output is one of the key foundational calculations that is being used to validate climate change and a lot of the the energy capacity being staying on staying on the earth because if earth isn't emitting a lot of energy or emitting as much energy as it used to because of greenhouse gases trapping it that means we've got a lot more energy in our atmosphere to feed a lot stronger storms hurricanes volatile actions of this that or the anything or even just high winds so that's what uh, this is being used for and that's actually got They got a follow-on updated version of this one that's about to go on a couple of different missions, but I had no idea what it's called. Or I did, but I can't remember. So okay. <laughs> and here's some of that imagery. I don't know the science. I think she does. Do you? I mean, I'm <laughs> assuming this is the heat budget. What do you want to say there? Cloud, cloud radio. Effect. So looking at the yeah, cloud radio effects. Maybe. I mean, I guess. How much activity of light is coming in? Yeah, right, yeah. How much? How much energy is coming off at any time? No, no, that makes sense because Greenland's lit up really high. Sahara's lit up, lit up really high. The desert. Mode. Lighter color surfaces reflect a lot more sunlight. So if you look at uh, Antarctica and the north, that's actually good. But if we see that kind of reflection, because it means that it's keeping our cool, at least because the snow is reflecting on sunlight. The issue is that the Arctic is seeing the most warming right now. So the ice is melting, which is causing more absorption rather than reflection of sunlight. And you can see that around the edges of Greenland, it's yellow. So that's not a good sign, because that means it, it just, it's like a feedback loop. It keeps us warming Earth more. And we can't stop it once it goes in one direction. Yep. Yeah. There you go. So that's all I have. Any questions? Um, Good. Do you do any imaging from any, any like great um, electromagnetic waves that come from below, to, like the Earth's surface, or like underground, like just from like the those the basic pulses of the Earth? Do you do any imaging? No. Can you do any imaging? I mean, if they're coming out of the surface, depending on the Amplitude, we could pick them up, but I don't know if we're picking up any subsurface anything. So, like, yeah, like with a, a volcano, say for example, a volcanic eruption happens, like, we'll definitely be able to pick up a volcanic eruption because it's coming at the surface. But if you're, if you're looking for any subsurface anything, like, that would be the only window through which we'd be able to catch that. And I don't know, like, Earth, I don't think Earth's going to be emitting a lot of super high energy light like i say x-ray gamma and anything beyond that so a lot of the signatures that we you might be looking for or interested in would be lost in the signal of the regular microwave sound away or yeah microwave infrared or visible so it the answer is yes but we won't be able to like isolate it um okay we're probably be worried about Favorite projects I've worked on? Probably 
probably JPSS one. Because that was the that was the first launch I worked on. And so I was there doing a lot of the pre-launch operations. And then once like it launched, we got to activate a satellite and go through all of the like, hey, we we turned on this instrument. Is the data coming down right? How do we calibrate this? Oh, let's flip the satellite upside down so we can look at the moon. Let's flip the satellite sideways so we can check this out at some angle to get the glint of the ocean or something. Like it was it was the first time that I got to get a lot of hands on with where engineering and science meet. Because like the science is just like, it'd be really cool if we took this picture. And then me as the engineer or the operator talk to the team and be like, so how do we take that picture? And they're like, well. The orbit's going to be in that position at this time, and if we angle it this way and then turn it so much, and then we might even tilt it over here. Like it's it was a lot of fun planning to execute a lot of cool little pet projects. And I wasn't I was I was young enough to be like involved in the the fun and the planning, but not old enough to be like accountable if anything had gone wrong. <laughs> which is why I didn't like the which is why J, JPSS two was like. Like it's it's a second favorite, but I was like in a position where like, oh man, if this goes wrong, I gotta explain a lot of things to a lot of people. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? General or otherwise? Oh my god. Well, is it college or um, are you good enough to work or you learn more actually being a job? College prepares you good enough. With the knowledge base, work finally teaches you how to bound the problems, if that makes sense. Because, like in college, like you're, at least in my college experience, I learned a whole lot of, I learned a whole little about a whole lot, and I felt like I knew a lot. And then I got to actual working, and I was, it was quickly apparent that I was just like, hey, like I know enough to get started on this. There's so much more to now know, but then also there's so much more to learn when it comes to the limitations of different particular applications and theory and science and all that sort of stuff and what needs to what they need to be worked in concert with and what can be sort of ignored. So they both have their place. I, I like more on the job training. I will say that. We also have some questions here. Oh, it's not. So how do NASA scientists account for the delays and feedback from their satellites? Are delays a big issue or is the data received and sent to satellites basically instantaneously? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a really good question. So for the scientists, so there are two types of delays that I guess they could be worrying about with this one. Delays of the telemetry performance data for the satellite, like how it's oriented, how the different sensors are working, and then also delays for the science data. And the science data delays are dealt with really at a, in my experience, at like a programmatic, programmatic or a, some super boss or some program chief says, this is what we want the, the science delays or the science data latency to be within, and then you design the project to that and make sure that it meets that performance metric. And um, so it's really done at the design spec level for the science data delays. For the operational, like, limited data delays, for geosatellites, that's not necessarily an issue because they're parked at an exact point over the sky for the duration of their mission. And so, and they also have a full hemispheric view of the Earth on that side. So if there's any antenna that have that within their line of sight, they can just lock onto that and get the data, or do, they can use that to lock on the data that and get the performance data. It'd be like, hey, the satellite's suffering from high solar winds, or this sensor went wrong, or this or that or the other thing. So that latency is not necessarily an issue because they can get that instantaneous. So for the low Earth ones, they're traveling, they're at not a high enough altitude to be able to have full Earth coverage from any one set from any one antenna, so we actually have to keep in mind which antennas are going to be in view at what time, 
and then use those to check on the real time data as it comes down. Because once we're in a contact, it's like we can get that at real time. But we also use that to downlink data that was recorded to a memory location on the satellite that will fill us in on what happened in the gaps that we couldn't see. So that's where that performance data latency comes in. And that's also written into design spec space. And um, it depends, it varies on a project to project. On the two projects that I'm working on, or at least on the one that I'm working on now, their science data latency is like, we want a fresh image of all the images we're expecting to get once every 16 days. But for the NOAA stuff, the weather forecasting, they're like, hey, we want the data immediately. If it's more than an hour and a half old, we don't want it because it's not going to be good for forecasting. Anymore. So it really depends on what the data application is, what drives the latency requirements or the allowable latency. So great question. Um, Palman, Chris, and ATM device. Sorry, size. How many, how many Chris and ATMS devices are required to get a full spectrum map of the atmosphere? Yeah. Two per satellite, and or at least on the ones that I work on, each satellite has a Chris, a Chris and an ATMS instrument. And then I think I've mentioned it before. There's another project or another mission that's going up on that similar project that's just going to put up an ATMS and see how it goes by itself. Um, and even then, I think for those NOAA satellites. If the Chris instrument, for whatever reason, broke on orbit, so long as ATMS still worked, they were like, we, we still want it. We'll still take that data. Why for some of the mappings of Earth's atmosphere, is the Earth so distorted to wide oval? I know, well, maybe Neil deGrasse Tyson said the Earth is pear-shaped, but why are the maps so distorted? For example, the shortwave cloud mapping. So distortion comes in. And this is just an entirely partial answer. I don't, I don't have the full answer for this one because I'm not really on the science side. But I knew, do know that the distortion comes in with how the sensors are designed to look at the Earth at a certain angle from wherever they're um, coming in at. So if we go back. Oh, wait. Oh, sorry. Go, back to... <laughs> go back to. Let's go back to. It's one of the first ones, that full. This one? No. Well, I mean, that's 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 a distortion one. But if we go, so that one, that one's not distorted at all because that's coming from. Ah! Did you want to go back to that? Sorry. Yeah, I wasn't done. <laughs> My yeah, bad. This one's not distorted at all because it's coming from a geosynchronous satellite, so it can just see everything, and you don't get any of the pear shaped distortions. But if you go to one of the other ones, where we're getting the yeah one of these, and you can see some of that distortion. That's coming from the low Earth orbit satellite data, and that distortion comes from how the data was processed and how it's received. Because remember, for those low Earth ones, they're looking at the Earth from 800 kilometers up, and so they can only see a small little swatch. Like each one of these little, like you might not be able to see it in the class, but these are like little paint strokes by the um, equator, and those are the swaths that the uh, the instruments are seeing. And um, when those swaths, depending on how they get overlaid onto, say, a globe or like a projection map or any of these other different cartography, that that's what then causes some distortion to show up and how the data gets overlaid. The best analogies that uh, geographers use is to think of an orange peel and trying to squish a orange peel down flat and what would happen through the edges yeah. of that orange peel. That's why some maps appear like Greenland's huge, even though it's not, and Africa's yeah. really small, even though it's not. Yes. Um, that, those same sort of geographic projection or, yeah, no. Um, geometric, that's the word. Geometric projection issues are, what, are what, what's affecting that. What college did you attend and what internships did you have before working at NASA? I went to Georgia Tech. And then internships. I had an internship working at an HVAC company. I was a personal trainer. And I worked in a vibrations lab. So none of those internships directly led me to NASA. But networking that, did though. Network, yeah, networking <laughs> did. <laughs> and NASA will happily take anybody who um who's willing to apply themselves and has a wealth of different knowledge, all that sort of stuff. So, so what Wait, was yeah. your agent? Mechanical engineering. 
so you didn't have to do any engineering related internships to get like don't you have to take your some kind of a big like test or whatever to be like a official engineer depending on the field of engineering you go into yes the so yeah mechanicals civils i think electricals too i mean our friend who jake that works for now so as an engineer yes he was just in the military that's where yeah. he got his education so but i no, the big test you're referring to is like the professional engineer thing yeah and that is that's applicable for certain types of engineering and certain types of field like if i went to pursue my career in hvac or like as building buildings then yeah i'd need to get my pe and i need to do the pre pe test i forgot what it was called but um so is that only needed for more like corporate level jobs of like engineering or if i wanted to be more like federal side of like the government or something would i need that more or less i do know it's more geared toward the private sector and i also know that there are public sector jobs that want to say require it a friend of mine works for montgomery county as mm -hmm. a civil engineer and he was required to get it yeah like it really depends on the the application of engineering and how like the PE, yeah, like yeah, and your boss, and your like, boss, they and like, what kind of line, what kind of licensing you need to, do, to perform that kind of the, the kind of engineering that you're looking to do. Like for NASA, fortunately, I don't need to have my PE, but it's it didn't hurt to have, or at least I've taken the test. But also, that's like an eight-hour test. Nobody likes that test. Here's another one. About how long does it take to send a satellite in space, starting from planning the mission to designing the satellite? I knew you were going to laugh at that one. <laughs> uh, yeah. Don't make oh, me cry. Oh, that, that, no, that one hurts. <laughs> so it really, it really depends on uh, the scope of the mission and what the the application of the satellite is like communication satellites gps satellites these days they're a dime a dozen they can be like hey like what kind of com links do you want what kind of whatever do you want and then they can have those they can launch those six six seven a year and just be up there like oh hey, we found your ride and we'll go um a lot of the weather satellites that i've worked on or at least the weather satellites that i've worked on from conceptualization to launch Anywhere from six years to a decade, depending on politics and programmatics and funding. Red tape. Red tape, bureaucratic stuff. Um, for a lot of the big science missions, say like the Juno probe that went to Jupiter recently, the Cassini mission that did satellite or that did um, Saturn, New Horizons that flew past, past Pluto and was in um, deep space now. Again, like conceptualization to launch, again, anywhere between five and 15 years. Like, and another big, no, no another huge example for that one is uh, the James Webb Telescope that just went out. Like, they've been talking about the James Webb Telescope as a Hubble replacement since Hubble got fixed. Like, they, they fixed the lens on Hubble. And um, so that was, what, 30 years ago. And the running joke with James Webb is they'd always been, they've been two years out for 10 years or something like that. So it all depends. And yeah. Why and how did you figure out you wanted to become a NASA engineer? And did you have a mentor? I always wanted to become a NASA engineer. We were actually joking about this earlier because like growing up, I wanted to be an astronaut or a baseball player, particularly Ken Griffey Jr. I knew that second one wasn't going to happen. So I, and I realized, I was like, oh, I'm good at math and science. And people were just like, oh, if you want to be an astronaut, go into engineering. That's about all the guidance I had. And so that also answers the second part of the question. I didn't really have a mentor. And uh, I really, really fortunately fell into this position thanks to Dr. Cardona and a mutual friend of ours. And um, since then, I've just been enjoying it. Um, but uh, as far as providing mentorship or networking activities, I'm 
happy to help out, reach out, and be provide some advice. This is why making connections matters. Hmm? I can go sing if they need students. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess speakers have said the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> So we have uh, uh, four people online. Uh, any other questions from the online crew? Yeah, I'll, I'll say anything from the, we have one from the room. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I'll get you an email. I'll, I'll give it to her to then give to all, all of you. <laughs> I feel, feel like that'd be the easiest thing to do. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and I can also send you the recording of this video if you email me. Yeah. And any other uh, questions, curiosities? On and out. All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending and yes. thank you, thank Joey, you. for being here. <laughs>